if we can have uh, Kyle Frazier, if you'd come out and join us at this point, try and get our people out here. An old colleague of mine from PBS Days in Los Angeles, Dr. Michael Shermer. Michael, if you'll join us now as well. Well, my role is somewhat limited tonight, but I do have the most important duty of all. This is a cell phone. Turn yours off. Please. Okay. Now, panelists agreed that I could do this. We like to know with whom we are conversing. Would all of those of you who believe in God, however you understand that to mean, please stand up. Those of you who denominate yourself as a Christian, please continue to stand. The rest, please sit. What? If you, if you are a Christian, remain standing. If you are a Christian who believes that the earth was created in the last 10,000 years or so, please remain standing. The rest of you sit. It's a young earth crowd. Oh, my goodness. We ask only as we talk about, okay, you can all sit down now. It's not like Simon says. I, you know, well, <laughs> I do that with the first graders that I teach on Sunday, and they always win. I, um, I would encourage you to bring to this debate that which C.S. Lewis brought to every single one of his books, an openness to experience and a wonder at the world as it is created. I am a mere Christian. Denomination doesn't matter tonight. It ought not to matter in how we consider our panelists' presentations. But listen with an open mind and with the spirit to be uh, led as uh, our authors and experts bring us. And here are the rules, so you know what we're going to do. 15-minute beginning statements from uh, each of our panelists, followed by five-minute rebuttals, conversations. That takes us to an hour if you're doing the math and you're a lawyer really slow, like me. Uh, and then two-minute round, and then we're going to take a break. So a mere hour and ten minutes away you'll have a chance to mumble to your neighbor about what's been said. But until then, until we get to our break, please listen with great attention. We begin with Dr. Kent Hoban. Doctor. All right. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here in Minnesota. <laughs> My name is Kent Hoban. I live in Pensacola, Florida. I was a high school science teacher 15 years. And now for 14 years, I've been doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I stand without apology for the concept that God created this world in six literal days about 6,000 years ago. And I think the evolution theory is one of the dumbest theories in the history of humanity. So there's where I stand. OK. Now, I will present the creation view. This is what I believe. That's how science is supposed to work. You present your theory, and everybody tries to prove it wrong. If you can't prove it wrong, then maybe it's right. The Bible teaches about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And I don't need any help to interpret that verse, and I don't think the average person does either. I think he's telling us he made it in six days. And the Bible says death came into the world because of man's sin. Man disobeyed God, and that's what messed this place up. The Bible says by man came death, in Adam all die. And before the flood came, the Bible says the people lived to be more than 900 years old. During this time, reptiles, which never stopped growing, would grow to be enormous. Dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve. And then Noah took them on the ark. We cover all that in my video number three of my series. Then there came a big flood. God was sick and tired of all the sin, so he completely wiped out this world with a universal flood, not a local flood, a, a completely worldwide flood that destroyed this entire planet. And that left behind all the fossils, the oil, the coal, the natural gas, the uh, sediment layers that we see, and the canyons like Grand Canyon, all formed during that flood in the days of Noah. Noah brought onto the ark two basic kinds, two of each basic kind of animal. Since then, there's been a lot of varieties produced. There's been, a, you know, big dogs and little dogs, and they probably had a common ancestor, a dog. <laughs> now... Science tells us things that we can observe or study or test. That is science, okay? Evolution is not science, and technically creation is not science. Neither view is technically scientific. We cannot observe the creation. We cannot observe the evolution theory. Both are inherently religious. The difference is the evolution religion is tax-supported. 
That's the primary difference. Now, I like science. I'm not against science. I collect science books, and I'll debate anybody on any scientific topic. If I know don't know, I'll say I don't know. But I'm not against science, and I don't know any Christians that are. But there are some things mixed in with our science books that are just simply poisonous. Now, Texas has a law that requires instructional materials to be factual. That's a law, okay? Florida has a law that says textbooks shall be accurate. Wisconsin has a law that says textbooks shall have factual accuracy. Alabama says textbooks shall be adequate and current. California says textbooks shall be factually accurate and reflect current and confirmed research. Minnesota says a teacher shall not deliberately suppress or distort subject matter. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hey there, fella. You betcha. Okay. Now, the problem is none of those states are enforcing those laws. There are things used to support the evolution theory that are just plain lies. There is no other way to say it. It's a lie. And we're going to try to get to some of those tonight. But we need to define what we're talking about. This word evolution has at least six different meanings. Only one of them is scientific. First, you would have to have cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, and matter. Nothing can evolve unless there's something there to evolve. So you have the evolutionists are always trying to avoid this one because they say it's not part of evolution. It has to be part of evolution. People say, well, you know, we just believe evolution is dealing with things changing. Okay, well, how did the things start? You don't have a coherent theory unless you can explain the origin of time, space, and matter. Secondly, there'd have to be chemical evolution. According to the Big Bang Theory, the Big Bang produced hydrogen and maybe some helium. Well, how did we get these other elements? You mean uranium evolved from hydrogen? They'll say, well, this happens in fusion in stars. Yeah, but you can't get past iron with fusion. There is no explanation for why we have all these different chemicals other than God designed it. Thirdly, we'd have to have stellar evolution. The stars would have to evolve. Nobody's ever seen a star forming. We see a few spots getting brighter, and the evolutionists will say, see, see, there's a star forming. No, there's a spot getting brighter. Okay? It could be the dust is clearing, and you're seeing a star that was already there. Nobody's ever proven the formation of one star. And yet there's enough stars out there right now that everybody on planet Earth can personally own two trillion of them to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. <laughs> Fourthly, there would have to be organic evolution. Somewhere, somehow, life has to get started. And the evolutionists really don't like to talk about this one, but they're stuck with a very embarrassing position. Modern 21st century scientists are still believing something proven wrong 200 years ago by Pasteur and Francisco Reddy. They still believe in spontaneous generation that life can come from non-living material. Now, if you want to believe that, that's perfectly fine. I don't care what you believe. Don't call that science. And don't make me pay to put that in the public school system as part of science, okay? That's, that's part of your religion. You ought to keep that at home. Fifthly, we have what is sometimes called macroevolution. I don't like this word, and nor the next one, but this says there are changes from one kind of animal to another. Nobody's ever seen that happen, okay? Lastly, we have what's called micro, and I really don't like that phrase, but I'm going to use it tonight to explain it. Microevolution tells us there are variations within the kinds. You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you're going to get a dog, okay? The first five definitions of this word are purely religious. None of those have been observed at all. They are outside the realm of science. But the evolutionist has to believe that all five of those happened. What we do observe are billions of little changes within the kinds. The Big Bang Theory teaches 20 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang where nothing exploded and produced everything. <laughs> this is what the textbook says. 18 or 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. For some unknown reason, this region exploded. Everything in the universe, smaller than a period on a page. Wow. That's a crowded dot. <laughs> and then 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down and formed a rocky crust. Yes, boys and girls, the planet Earth cooled and a rocky surface was created. And the Earth's surface was hot, and there were large pools of bubbling lava. But it rained on the rocks for millions of years. This is what the textbooks teach, okay? Millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Boy, I guess it is. Totally stopped. Doesn't even happen. That's how slow it is. This guy said, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So according to the standard evolution theory in the textbooks, 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down. It rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. So great, 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 grandpa was soup. <laughs> now, there's no question there are an awful lot of different varieties of dogs in the world, and I don't think there's a question they probably had a common ancestor, but it was a dog. That doesn't mean all the dogs came from a rock. 
okay, 4.6 billion years ago. What evidence do they give to support this theory for evolution? The textbook says we've got evidence from fossils. Oh, now, come on, any freshman law student can tell you no fossils could possibly count as evidence for evolution. You don't know those bones had any kids. Bring your bones into court. Hey, Your Honor, these, are the, these, are, these bones are the ancestors of everybody today. Yeah, right. You don't know those are the ancestors of anybody. I mean, a kindergartner ought to figure that one out. Evidence from structure, evidence from molecular biology, evidence from development. All the known, all the supposed scientific evidence for evolution has been proven wrong years ago. There is no evidence for the theory. Now, I don't mind if somebody wants to believe in it. This is America, the land of the fee and the home of the slave, or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> and if you want to believe in evolution, that's perfectly fine. Honestly, I don't care. But I, for one, resent them using my tax dollars to teach that dumb theory to the kids in school at taxpayer expense. They ought to go start their private schools. <clears throat> Evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. Number one, they assume that mutations will make something new and better. That has never been observed. Secondly, they will assume that natural selection makes it survive and take over the population. You see, in order for evolution to really work, if one animal evolves a little better than the rest, what must happen to the rest of them to make this work? Well, they've got to die. Evolution is a religion of death, not life. The question is very simple in my mind. Did man bring death into the world, or did death bring man into the world? Because if evolution is true, death is the hero of the plot. Darwin understood that very well and said so on page 217 of his book. It's true that mutations happen. There's no question there. But mutations do not produce any evolution. This is a five-legged bull. That's a mutant. It's not, there's no new information. It's a scrambling of existing information. Same with the short-legged sheep. That's a mutant. But there's no new information. This two-headed turtle is a mutant. It's not ninja, but he's mutant. Um, <laughs> and he's going to freeze first winter because nobody makes a double-neck turtleneck sweater. See? <laughs> mutations are a scrambling of information that is already existing. They're not going to create a thing. Um, this textbook shows a four-winged fly, and it says, normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Then it says, beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Well, excuse me, why don't they give an example of a beneficial mutation? Because nobody's ever seen one. <laughs> they show the kids a bad one, and there's plenty of those, but they never show a good one. One professor said, I know a good mutation. People in Africa that get sickle cell anemia cannot get malaria as easily. I said, well, that's, that's brilliant, sir. That's like saying if you cut off your legs, you can't get athlete's foot. <laughs> and by the way, that's always the one they bring up, okay? That's, that's all they've got. Textbook says evolution and natural selection go together. Oh, come on. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create anything. Creationists don't argue about natural selection. I think it happens. But it selects. It's not a creative process. This horse was artificially selected by humans down to get the smallest horse they could get. As far as they know, the smallest one in the world. Talk about useless. <laughs> See, natural selection is not a creative process. It doesn't create a thing. I taught biology. I'm not against biology. Natural selection works, folks, but it doesn't create. It just selects. If you worked in a factory that made cars and you selected the good ones to go through and the bad ones to not make it out the, out the door, how long would it take that selection process to create an airplane out of that car? <laughs> it's not going to do it, okay? You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you're going to get a dog. And probably the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. But every five-year-old kid knows they're the same kind. I do this all the time. I get a five-year-old kid. Okay, kid, here we got a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? <laughs> they get it every single time, okay? See, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind, not after their species. Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of Species. Who knows? Nobody's ever given a good definition of what a species is. They say, well, a dog and a, dog and a wolf are different species. Yeah, but they can, still, they can still interbreed and produce puppies. So what is the good, hard, fast definition of species anyway? The Bible says it's the same kind, and that's where the argument ought to be held. Variations certainly happen, but they have limits. Farmers have been trying for years to get bigger pigs. Do you think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas? <laughs> no. My whole point is there are limits. We have roaches in Florida, big ones. Roaches eventually become resistant to pesticides, but they will never become resistant to a sledgehammer. <laughs> We could spend hours on the resistance. I only got a few minutes left here, but uh, uh, I grew up in Illinois, corn country. There are so many kinds of corn, they have to number them. You'll drive down the highway and there's BX65. You know, don't mix it up with XL29, something will explode. But I'll tell you what, folks, you can crossbreed corn from now until the cows come home and you're always going to get corn. 
You never get a hamster or a whale or a tomato to grow on your corn stalk, okay? Um, <laughs> Variety of dogs, this Irish textbook calls it divergent evolution. Oh, come on, a poodle and a terrier coming from a wolf is not divergent evolution. Don't give it a fancy name, it's still a dog, okay? It's a variety of dog. And there are thousands of examples of variations that happen within the kinds, and creationists don't argue about that. Variations happen. But the point is, they're still the same kind, which is precisely what the Bible said would happen. Tomorrow is the Kentucky Derby. You know, in the last hundred years, they've gone from an average winning speed of 127 to an average winning speed of 123. Now, even in the old days, they got some good times turned in. How much money would you guess has been spent on the Kentucky Derby trying to get faster horses? Now, I don't know if they reach the absolute limit for horse speed or not, but I suspect they're getting kind of close. I mean, if you really want to win the Kentucky Derby, why don't you breed wings on your horse and fly around the track in 12 seconds? Hmm? <laughs> the whole point is, variations happen, but they're limited. This, text, this, this magazine, you can order chickens. What kind you want? Red rocks, white rocks, cherry eggers, brown leghorns. And then it says, jungle fowl are the original bird from which all varieties and strains of domesticated chickens are derived. Did you know all the chickens had a common ancestor? It was a chicken. <laughs> Creationists don't argue. Variations happen. God created an incredible gene code in each of the original kinds of animals, and they can produce a wide variety of offspring. Some of them can live in the cold weather, and some can live in the hot weather. And they probably had a common ancestor. No argument. But that's not evolution. Tonight you're going to hear three different opinions. Tonight, the right one, which you just heard, and then two others. Uh, God created this world in six literal days. He made it with the animals with a variety to produce an incredible variety of offspring. Then he destroyed this world with a flood. And the Bible teaches he's going to come destroy it again one of these days, pretty soon. And if you're not ready for that, you ought to get ready soon. Thank you. The second of our opening statements on the subject and matter of how did we get here and when did we arrive is Kyle Frazier. Kyle. Test, test. Well, what a hard act to follow, and especially seeing all you raise your hands and realizing that we're in quite a bit of a minority here. I would just uh, like to start out by saying a, a brief thank you. Um, in, you, in particular to you for your kind attention. And um, I would also like to show my, or say my appreciations to uh, Drs. Hovind and Dr. Shermer uh, for, uh, for attending here tonight. I hope you understand after preparing for this, and this is the first such event like this for myself, I can honestly say I've never worked for anything any harder in my life and still feel totally unprepared. So um, you'll, I'll just have to You'll just have to accept that uh, the amount of time and sacrifice that they took to be, to be here and participate was a significant sacrifice. Second, I would also like to thank my um, science advisory team, Jeff McCallum, Paul Nyhus, and Walter Remind, whom you may meet at our book, tour, our book table in the back. Um, uh, I would like to start out just kind of by clarifying the purpose of debates. I, know, I don't know about you guys, but... Um, I've been to a few d debates in my life, and I always kind of went there thinking, well, you know, when I get there, I'm going to find, you know, people are going to um, change. Everybody's going to get up there, and it's going to change a lot of people's views. And um, the hope is, is that, um, you know, you people go with me. Why don't we turn this one off, and I'll take one from the table. Still not with me? Here we go. Okay. Um, but the point I, I, <clears throat> I did, I, I used to come to these debates and think, oh, co okay, great. Um, we're going to see somebody get up there and say something that's going to change Michael Shermer's mind, and he's, you know, he might uh, come out of here with a, a, a totally changed person. Or maybe the people that came here are going to be in that same, um, uh, they're, they're going to go through a change process, and we can actually see that before our eyes. And um, I would just like to clarify that I don't really believe that this kind of a dialogue has that purpose, to get uh, people here who are going to change their view. Um, because actually, uh, if we're trying to get people to a point where uh, we've got a majority, for example, that's already been accomplished, hasn't it? And but the rest of you still came here for one reason. You still want to interact with this dialogue. Why is that? Because there's a sense of curiosity, a sense of seeking, that this isn't something that you can 
you can set in concrete and say, I have this established. And for that reason, I don't think the purpose is to establish a consensus or a majority. I like to quote from Tom Sawyer when he says, um, well, ain't we got the majority of, peop- a majority of fools in town on our side? And ain't that a majority in almost any place? The truth of the matter is, is that you can almost always form a consensus. But the point shouldn't be to form a consensus. I think rather of, of the quote by Abraham Lincoln when he said, when asked uh, by, a confeder- or by a Union soldier, do you think, uh, uh, President Lincoln, that the Lord is on our side? And uh, Lincoln said, well, I don't think that the issue here is that, um, that the Lord should be on our side. The issue should be that I be on the Lord's side. Okay? And so that's what I'm trying to find here is, a, is a, an, an area of truth. Uh, you might have noticed with my accent uh, just a moment ago that I'm, I'm not exactly a Minnesotan. I'm trying very hard. Don't you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, I can do some of those things. But no, I'm just a, a, a Kansas farm boy, basically. Um, now to um, the matter at hand. What I would like to accomplish this evening and what I intend to prove is that there is irrefutable evidence for the intelligence, an intelligence, a master mind behind creation. And what is sufficient proof and how will I define it? I will present evidential proof and not empirical proof. Just like Brother Hovind, I don't think that I'm going to stand up here and prove to anybody that there is a God. Um, I'm going to go to a different point in my notes because they gave me some additional time. And that is, what I consider proof sometimes may seem a little bit um, vague. It may involve some inferences. Take, for example, I invited my dear friend Al Binsman to be here with me this evening. And pragmatist that he is, he looked at the price of the ticket. 980, he said. What on earth caused them to pick that number? Now, if human beings are pattern-seeking, storytelling animals, 980 seems to make no sense. So I gave it some thought. Why 980? Then I made up the following story. Since 980 on the radio dial is where KKMS broadcasts, it's some sort of subliminal message. (laughs) Fix your dial to 980. You know, too bad it wasn't radio station 580. You know, you'd have gotten a break. (laughs) But then again, at least it wasn't the Patriot, because what's that, like 1280 or something? Okay. (laughs) We're getting back to evidence. I'm going to take a first look, and what I'm going to do is to not... I'm going to use forensic-type proofs and not try to prove that he exists, only that his acts are evidence. And from them, we can surmise that there is reason to infer his presence... I will prove that God had method, motive, and opportunity and is the mastermind behind the universe. For our witnesses, I would like to call first, if we let the trial begin, would nature please take the stand? What does nature say? Are God's fingerprints on the universe? Well, let's not forget the swearing in. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So hope you God. And nature says, of course I do. I submit for your consideration Exhibit A. Exhibit A is the sudden and mysterious beginning of space, matter, energy, and time. Following the introduction of the theory of general relativity, the scientific community discovered that something had gone terribly wrong. If E equals MC square were true, there was a time when all that never, or all that is, never was. Physicist Paul Davies said, This singular event represents the creation not only of all matter in the universe, but of space and time as well. What preceded the creation was not just a featureless void, but literally nothing at all. Now for your consideration, I submit Exhibit B. Exhibit B is an expanding universe. In 1929, Edwin Hubble announced his famous Law of Redshifts as evidence for the expansion of the universe. This expansion is extremely fine-tuned to produce our universe. The value of it is one part in 10 to the 120th power. Comparing that to human capacity, our best measuring device can make measurements at one in 10 to the 23rd power, which to borrow from Hugh Ross would mean that the mastermind is at a minimum 10 trillion, 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 trillion times more intelligent, knowledgeable, creative, powerful, 
and not to mention better funded than we human beings are. Why is that so profound, this expansion in the universe? Simply put, it gets at the root of physics. Objects at rest stay at rest. Objects in motion stay in motion. We've all heard that before, haven't we? Therefore, something or someone has to act if things are moving in the universe. Finally, I would like to provide nature's exhibit C. Exhibit C, the entropy or the cooling off of the universe. This fact was announced in 1992 by a team of physicists regarding their findings from the Cosmic, Explorer, Cosmic Background Explorer Satellite, or COBE satellite. The universe was cooling exactly as predicted by the general theory of relativity. Stephen Hawking, known for understatement, said, it is the discovery of the century, if not of all time. George Smoot, UC Berkeley astronomer and co-project leader, said, we have found, <coughs> excuse me, we have found evidence of the birth of the universe. It is like looking at God. It, you know, and just out of deference to my brother Hovind here, I, I've seen that picture, and I'm not so sure that it looks exactly like God to me. On the other hand, the reality of this entropy, the cooling phenomena going on, is featured in this picture. Implications. Having considered these evidences, it is important to understand the implications, and there are several. The first is, is that nothing begets nothing. We know the method of the mastermind. It was the precisely tuned transcendent creation of space, matter, and time in the finite past. Or in the words of my favorite philosopher and theologian turned 70s pop vocalist Billy Preston, Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. So you see, you've got to have something if you want to be with me. <laughs> then again, for you intellectuals in the crowd, and perhaps you don't date back to the 70s, I have another argument. That is, everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. B, the universe began to exist, and therefore C, the universe has a cause of its existence. Second implication is this, that there's simply not enough time. The implications of a recent Big Bang are catastrophic for the theory of evolution, which needs near infinite time to construct even the simplest life form. If all the material in the universe were converted into the building blocks of life, amino acids, proteins, and if assembly of these blocks were attempted once a microsecond for 17 billion years, the number of opportunities to form a living entity is so small as to make it virtually impossible. You cannot construct life no matter how much time you've been given. And so my particular view may say there's 17 billion years, but there's not enough time. By the way, there's, there needs to be a correction up there. That's 10 to the uh, 1 with 11 zeros after it, not 10 whatever that big number is. It's still a very big number. Is there evidence of motive? I've mentioned we need to prove that. Motive is present in nature too, and that's the form of life. Over 45 parameters of the universe have been identified that must be carefully fixed in value for any kind of conceivable life, just not life as we know it, to exist at any time in the history of the universe. Commenting on a few of the parameters, British astrophysicist Fred Hoyle concluded that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well with, as with chemistry and biology. Here's an example of some of the 47. I'd like to start at the top of the list and work my way down. No, I'm just kidding. I don't have time. Is there evidence of opportunity? Thank you, Michael. I appreciate the laughter. At least somebody on the podium up here is paying attention. In 1968 and 1970, breakthrough research, Hawkins, Ellis, and Penrose, that's them up on the top, provide, or beg, beg your pardon, proved that the equations of general relativity guarantees the existence of a singular boundary or starting point for space and time. Hawking himself pointed to the breathtaking conclusion that time must have a beginning. For those of you who are Fox News fans, Hawking is who Homer Simpson said, there's so much I don't know about astrophysics. I wish I read that book by that cool wheelchair guy. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> Stephen Hawking's again. Next, don't. Divine revelation, our second witness. I'm going to call a second witness to this stand because the evidence is just from one witness when we look at nature. But are there others? Yes. The next witness I would like to call is the Holy Scriptures. We will call on them first as character witnesses and then to testify. 
What do the scriptures say about our first witness, the witness of nature? They say this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. But does scripture point to motive? Yes. Now what do the scriptures themselves say about the master mind? They say the following. In exhibit A, Hebrews 11:3. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. You see, there was a transcendent beginning. Is there evidence that there was an expanding universe also? Yes, I submit scripture exhibit B. Ex scripture exhibit B is Isaiah 42, 5. This is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out. I picked that image so you could get a view of what it looks like to stretch out. Here's some additional discussions about the stretching out process. It's perhaps the, the best stated phenomena of the visible universe in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Finally, is there evidence of cooling or the entropy in the universe in the scripture? Yes, I submit scripture, exhibit C. Exhibit C is Romans 8, 20 through 23. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. You see, there is entropy, there is decay of all that is material. But lastly, in Scripture, is there evidence of motivation? Yes, there is. In Genesis 1, 26 through 27, we see that mankind is created in the very image of God, or a majo Dei, if you will. We are the only sentient beings that are material in the universe that can have a relationship with their cre creator. Finally, is there an evidence of opportunity? In the case of God, this is only possible if he were capable of acting in a realm independent of time, energy, and matter. Remember the Hawkins-Penrose um, theorems say that, 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 all, that there was no time before the universe began. So somebody had to be outside of time acting for us to, to have these phenomena. In Titus 1-2, God promised eternal life before the beginning of time. You see, in the classical Christian paradigm, that opportunity... For God to work out of time is seen in the third person of the Trinity. Kyle. Am I done? You are done. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your kind <laughs> attention. And now presenting the position that indeed there is not God behind how we got here and when we arrived, but with some dates to supply the gaps, Dr. Michael Shermer. Uh, the editor of Skeptic Magazine, which you can visit at skeptic.com. Michael. Hello. <laughs> Sounds like God speaking here. How we doing? I presume you know what you get when you cross an atheist with a Jehovah Witness. is somebody who knocks on your door for no reason at all. <laughs> I used to do that, actually. I used to do the knocking on doors thing. I was a born-again Christian. I went to Pepperdine University in uh, Malibu, California to Church of Christ School. I went to major in theology. I was a born-again. I went knocking on people's doors to save their souls. We called it Amway with Bibles. Essentially, you're selling God. And then after about seven years, I became a non-born-again, and uh, I became a born-again atheist. And then I went around knocking on those same doors saying, <laughs> I take it all back. I was wrong. <laughs> and then, you know, you get older and you find a sort of more middle position of which I now call myself an agnostic or just a non-believer. The question on the table here is, can we see evolution or some sort of scientific theory as a form of creation? I, I, I'm not psychic, so I actually have to tell the person when to go to the next slide. I wrote a book about this. Basically, I wrote a book about why it is that people believe in God. It, it began as an intellectual journey as to why I became a believer and then became a non-believer and how that happened. But in fact, it's a journey that everybody goes through at some point in their life. How did you become a believer if you become a non-believer? By the way, it's so hard to see with pretty much everybody standing up how many non-believers there are. I don't care what, you, what the label is, agnostic or heretic or secular or non-theist or whatever. Just, you just don't believe in God. Let me just see a show of hands. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, look at the time. Uh, <laughs> Hugh, I, I just, you know, I'd love to stay. But, uh, golly, isn't there a Laker game on tonight? No, that was last night. Oh, shoot. I have an 11-year-old daughter, and she said, uh, well, you know, where's the debate tonight? I said, it's in Minnesota, and it's at this Christian church. And she said, you're debating God at a Christian church? I said, yeah. She says, you're going to lose. <laughs> I, I thank you for her, I guess. <laughs> uh, so we can go to the, go to the next slide. Um, the problem here, is, um, the problem here is, is that all of these creationist arguments, uh, and I used to make them all, so I, I know the arguments, they're perfectly good reasons if you already believe. If you don't, they are not convincing reasons. And the reason for this is that these are all what we call God of the gaps arguments. You scientists can't explain blank, X, whatever. Therefore, there must be a God. This is along the lines of the famous Sidney Harris cartoon. These two scientists, the one says, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. And the step two there is, and then a miracle occurs. <laughs> you can't, it's just a word. A miracle is just a word for something we can't explain. I, I, I don't know how that happened. It must have been a miracle. Next slide. For example, just two weeks ago, I went to Clearwater, Florida. There is there a very famous, at least in Florida, a Virgin Mary appearance. It's a, it's a huge icon. The thing sits about 40 feet tall. Um, the, the local Christian church bought the bank building. It's on the side of a bank building. They bought the bank building. It cost them $10 million to preserve this, which they consider to be a miracle. Next slide. You can see people going there in crutches and wheelchairs. This was about six years ago when it first appeared. Uh, today, here's somebody in a wheelchair. They've put up a, a huge crucifix here. You can see the size of this thing. Next slide. Turns out, um, this is uh, myself and the amazing Randy Richard Dawkins standing in front of a bunch of candles here. There's so much wax from the candles, they had to put down that stuff they put in auto shops to soak up oil. There's so many people there praying to this miracle. Next slide. But in fact, if you walk around, you find out wherever there's a sprinkler head, there's a miracle of this mineral water spray that appears on the windows. Next slide. In fact, on the back side, there's another Virgin Mary that somebody began to wipe off. This used to be there about five years ago, so I'm not sure why the church wiped this off, but you can, you can see the miracle beginning to appear. There's another Virgin Mary here, yours truly here. Next slide. In fact, the question is, is it really a miracle of Mary, or is it a miracle of Marge? Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. As Kyle said in his many thoughtful comments, we are pattern-seeking storytelling animals. We, we tend to see what we're looking for. We, we see what we want to find. Now, I can't teach my entire course in evolutionary theory in 10 more minutes. So I'm, what I want to do is just leave you with, with one deep message with a couple of examples of, that, of this. And that is, even if I can't explain it, I can explain the Virgin Mary thing. It's mineral water spray. There used to be a palm tree there and the spray and left it there and they cut the palm tree down so people could see it. Okay, no big deal. Uh, I, I trust you're not putting your faith in your religion based on icons like that. But, but what about these other things? I claim that it's the same principle. That is, um, Kyle brought up the fine-tune problem. That is the fact that there's all these different anthropic adjustments. The universe is structured in such a way. It's just so carefully balanced. If it wasn't this way, it's not that we wouldn't be here, but there'd be some other species, or it'd be something like from Star Trek, you know, where you get these people with two eyes and gnarly things on their forehead, and they speak English with a, 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 a Klingon accent, wherever they speak English with a Klingon accent in the universe. Uh, it, it's that nothing would exist. And so you have all these different, the, the electrical force between a proton and electron and the Planck constant times the speed of light and Newton's gravitational constant G. And they have dozens of these. These are all real examples. These aren't just made up by an apologist and I'm going to get up there and tell you these constants aren't real or that the universe is not fine-tuned. It is. Next slide. The question is why is it fine-tuned and what are we to make of this? Well, there's several different answers, half a dozen different answers to this. But even if I can't answer it at all, or even if I'm wrong, that doesn't mean God did it. It just means it's a mystery. We don't know what it is. This is the principle I want you to take home tonight, just the one thing. For example, in the 17th century, there was what was called the plane problem. 
Newton identified, after his theory of gravity was published, that there is this weird phenomenon in the, in the, in the uh, solar system. All the planets are in a plane. They're in the same plane of the ecliptic, it's called. They're not like this and like this and so on. They're all in a plane, except for weird Pluto, which is probably just an errant moon. So for Newton, the explanation is God did it. That's the way God set up the solar system. Nobody makes that argument today because we now know exactly why the planets are all in a plane. It has to do with clouds of gas condensing into stars. So the problem is of hitching your faith to some scientific argument about fine-tunedness or some weird anomaly that scientists can't yet explain, what are you going to do with your faith when we come up with an explanation? Next slide. So for example, here's another answer to the fine-tuned problem. Maybe our universe is not the only universe. Maybe there's multiple bubble universes, lots of universes. Stephen Hawking suggests, in fact, that quantum fluctuations lead to the spontaneous creation of teeny universes out of nothing. And he means nothing. Most of the universes collapse to nothing, but a few will reach critical size, will expand in an inflationary manner, and will form galaxies and stars and maybe beings like us. Most of them don't. If they exist, we don't know that they exist. This is, this is mathematically possible. We're still collect, trying to collect data on this. Next slide. Uh, the latest issue of Scientific American just came out last week, has a whole issue devoted to this very subject. It's no longer science fiction. Now, cosmologists are beginning to devise ways to test, empirically test, to find out if there are other universes other than our own. So, in summary, if each of these different bubble universes, and there may be an infinite number of them, all have slightly different laws of nature, slightly different fine-tuned, not so fine-tuned, terribly tuned for life, and so on. All the ones that are terribly tuned and not so fine-tuned won't give rise to life. Any of them that are like ours, and if there's enough of them, and if there's an infinite number of them, that's enough, uh, any of them that are like ours may give rise to sentient beings like us who ask the question, where did we come from? That's one answer. It may be wrong. But if it's wrong, it doesn't make the God hypothesis right. It just means we don't know yet. Next slide. So <clears throat> continuing on the design thing, the, art, the, the question is what made the whale's flipper? This is just one of hundreds of exam examples I could use. The whale's flipper has this pretty, pretty nifty design for cutting through the water. The whole body of the whale is a fusiform body. The head it doesn't have a neck and shoulders. You know, they just all blend together for cruising through the water. It's hydrodynamic instead of aerodynamic. But if you actually take the skin off, you see what the flipper looks like. It looks like your arm. Now, why would an intelligent designer design a not so intelligently looking flipper? In fact, it looks like our flipper, except we don't have a flipper, we have an arm. The answer is, is because a top-down designer didn't build it. A bottom-up tinkerer called evolution did. Next slide. So for example, if humans were designed by God, we might look something like this to alleviate the lower back problems we have, more vertebrate that are thicker. To alleviate the problems of blood flow in the legs and blood collection in the legs, you have stronger veins and more valves. You have a much larger buttock muscles here to hold this upper thing. Your ears would be slightly different and so on. The, the arms would be shorter. The rib cage would be larger to hold the, the organs. Um, the, the point is this. Yes, it looks like design has happened. But is it really intelligent design? Does it look like a omniscient, omnipotent being really made us with all the little flaws in our design? Next slide. Another question, evolution or God or intelligent designer. We have two different hypotheses here. Dr. Hovind, God, and uh, Kyle, uh, intelligent designer, id, whoever id is. Um, the question is like, let's just say, let's take this one sequence of evolutionary, the evolution of the ceratopsians, like the tri triceratops, the most famous the little three-horned dinosaur, triceratops. Where'd it come from? Okay, re regardless of whether the picture is right or not, it's roughly right, because we have quite a few fossils here. When did id, or God, interject his influence? Was it, did he just create the general form and then evolution created all the other forms? Or did id, God, interject at each of the uh, family level, or at the genus level, or at the species level? When does God intervene when he's intervening? At every single individual born, is God tweaking the system? You will not find consensus among creationists on this question. 
It's very interesting that they dissent among themselves about how often and when God intervenes. Anything from he set the whole system up at the beginning and stepped out and just let it run by itself to he tweaks every single little molecule and genome in every single one of us that is born and everything in between. Next slide. So how do we know evolutionary theory is true? It's not true, capital T, true in a religious sense. It's not true in a political sense, not true in a legal sense. You've heard two legal metaphors tonight. This is the wrong metaphor. Science is not the law. It's a different way of thinking completely. This is why when lawyers try to do science and scientists try to do law, they, they get messed up. They shouldn't do that. There's different ways of thinking. Science uh, traffics in fine shades of gray with probabilities of being, uh, of being more closer to truth or less closer to truth. But there is no capital T truth. However, we are confident that it's provisionally true. That is, could be wrong. We'll see. But it gives a coherent explanation of what we know. It's consilient. That is, independent lines of inquiry all jump to the same conclusion. Uh, and it predicts new findings which so far have been confirmed empirically. For example, next slide. Just on the age of the Earth question, I just threw this in a sort of in the in the limo driving over here typing because I realized we were supposed to discuss the age of the Earth. I mean, how do we know how old the Earth is? A bunch of different ways. Potassium argon dating. There's half a dozen different radioactive decay dating techniques. Carbon-14 dating. Plus the age of the moon rocks, the age of the solar system, the age of the universe. Now, this is the point. These different ages that scientists infer from the different techniques are not done in one lab or at one conference by one committee that says, hey, look, you know, we got that creationist conference coming up. We got to get our story straight on what our date is. It doesn't work that way. These are different scientists in different fields who go to different conferences and read different journals and don't even know each other. And they all independently come up with the same rough uh, range of dates. The Earth is about four and a half billion years old, give or take a couple hundred thousand years. The universe is about... Dr. Hovind, it's about 14 and a half billion now, we think. Uh, and, and, it, and it changes. But it's not changing like between 6,000 years and 20 billion. It's changing between 14, 14 and a half, maybe 15, maybe 13 and a half, depending on who's doing the measuring. Now listen, if they all came up with the exact same number, then I would be suspicious that somebody was cooking the data. But they don't. The numbers vary all over the board, but they vary within a range. And the fact that they vary, and yet they're still within that tight range, gives me great confidence that this is correct. Next slide. Another example. Tests of evolutionary theory. Early fossils of life should contain only single cell organisms. And they do. You will not find a single human or any mammalian fossil in a bedding plane that has trilobites. Not one anywhere ever. Why is that? Two, organisms adapted to similar environments should evolve similar morphologies. They do. Whale bodies and fish bodies are all fusiform, designed to cut through the water smoothly. Why is that? Organisms sharing most of their DNA should develop following the same basic patterns. They do. Fossils found in different continents that were once united should be similar to each other. They do. Last slide here. So, what, what, in my rebuttal, then, we'll come back to irreducible complexity. But my point in my opening argument here is that we have answers to these mysteries. Some of them are, we're very confident in. Others we're less confident in. Others we admit that we're just guessing. We don't know. More data needs to be collected. But even if we're wrong about all of it, it doesn't make the God hypothesis right. And I would caution you, don't hook your faith to any scientific argument, because what are you going to do if it's wrong? Or what are you going to do if it turns out we have an answer? Thank you. How many lawyers do we have here this evening? Would you stand up? Lawyers? I'm, I'm here. I'm not sure. There's one or two. I love how Michael dismisses the law. Tonight when he gets caught speeding, I hope he says to the officer, you're talking about the law, I want to talk about the science of motors, and it's not going to work. In evidence class, we learn that the more powerful your argument, the shorter the amount of time you need to make it. And so now in the five minute round, a lot of the rhetoric goes aside and a lot of the sidebars, but the hardcore analysis of how did we get here and when did we arrive? Dr. Hovind? Is it five minute or six minute? My schedule says six. I'm not going to get this done here. 
All right, let me start with uh, Kyle Fraser's arguments. Uh, if we can get the screen black there. Uh, reasons to believe. Uh, reasons to believe what? Reasons to believe the Bible or reasons to believe Hugh Ross? I've always wondered about that one. Um, can we trust the Bible? Is the Bible literally true? Or do we, do we need some guru to tell us what it means? The average person reading that book is not going to come up with the billions of years that he comes up with. The average person reading the Bible is going to come up with six days about 6,000 years ago. And the Bible is going to say, there's no death till Adam sinned. The question of where did energy, life, matter, information, and organization come from is still, I think, the, of course, uh, Kyle Fraser, Fraser's position is, God did it. I agree. But is God capable of doing it and telling us how he did it? As far as the red shift, I cover this in great detail on videotape number uh, seven of my series out there. Get in my plug in here. His, most of his arguments seem to be based on the assumption that the red shift proves the universe is expanding, and the universe may be expanding. But that still doesn't prove it's billions of years old. On day one or day six, Adam was zero. But he didn't look zero. The trees had fruit on them. They were just three days old. They don't look like what we would think would be a three-day-old tree. The God that I worship is capable of creating a fully mature, fully functioning universe in six days, just like he said. He said, God is trillions and trillions and trillions of times more powerful than man. Man, that is, to me, that's heresy. God is infinitely powerful. This is a limited God. My God's not limited, okay? Look at the background radiation. It's like looking at God. To me, that also would be heresy. God doesn't look like that at all. And nature is the first witness. That was interesting. And the Bible is the second witness. I like nature. I like science. I'm not against science, but folks, that's not how it's supposed to work. The God that I worship is not only capable of creating, he's capable of writing a book and telling us how he did it, and he can preserve that book for everybody today. That's the God that I worship. Now, for uh, Michael Shermer, he said he was a born-again Church of Christ church member. I don't know if he was or wasn't. That's between him and God to judge, uh, which he will face one day. Uh, the majority of audience here believe in God, which is because we're, we're right in this case, all right? Uh, <laughs> The God of the gaps, you know, uh, miracles did it. You should look at the evolution theory and see how many miracles they have to pull in. You know, how did life get started? <laughs> His argument that the Virgin Mary appeared on the side of a building as a natural explanation, I agree. I think that's dumb. I think it's a fundraiser for the Catholic Church. I think there's a lot of that stuff goes on. Okay. <laughs> and I think he is very right to be skeptical of many of the things going on in Christianity. He's right. They ought to be skeptical, okay? My position is it's good to be skeptical of, th of things like that. Now, he ought to use the same skepticism on the evolution theory, but he's not doing that, okay? If we cannot explain it, that does not mean God did it. I agree. There are many natural explanations, okay? Do scientific explanations nullify our faith? Not at all. I love science. I don't know anything scientific that nullifies the Bible. I know that a lot of things the Bible contradicts from uh, evolution theory, but evolution is not part of science. Evolution is a religion. He said nearly, uh, by the way, let me just point out here, nearly all branches of science were started by creationists because he mentioned, uh, I forget what the point was that brought that up, but uh, I put it in here. Okay. Uh, Francis Bacon was a creationist, Kepler, Pascal, Boyle, uh, Newton. Uh, the, the list is huge of people who, creationists, who started just about every single major branch of science today. The evolution theory has done nothing to the improvement of science. It is a useless theory, and it is counterproductive, in my opinion. So you can't claim that scientists are all evolutionists. They're not. There are thousands of scientists today who are creationists. Okay? Many major branches of science were started by creationists. Let's see. Where did I leave off here? Uh, comparative anatomy. That was interesting that he would use that one about the whale's flipper. Comparative anatomy, if I can get to that one. Uh, oh, did I get to the right one? I'm sorry. I'm going to have to install the ocular enhancers. Uh, <laughs> Uh, hey, I'm 50 years old. I've been fighting it as long as I can, all right? It's true that the human arm and the whale's flipper and the bat's wing have some similarities. I agree. We have a radius and an ulna, so does the whale, okay? But the whale didn't name them, by the way. Uh, this textbook says, these struct homologous structures provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. This is baloney. Those structures provide evidence that they have a common designer. The same guy designed them all. It works great. Uh, you mentioned the Triceratops. When did God intervene? This is setting up a straw man argument, okay? He says, here's our chart showing how we think the different ceratops evolve. Now, where, how did God do this? That's, that's a straw man argument, okay? I don't know how many different kinds of creatures God originally created. That's up to him, I suppose, okay? And what he's done, he's taken the evolutionary assumption that there is some kind of order to this geologic column. And by the way, the geologic column does not exist any place on planet Earth, okay? Um, Geologic column is one of the biggest, cruelest jokes in the history of humanity. I taught her science for years. 
geologic column does not exist. And then he mentioned carbon dating and all these things give, give ages within a certain range, which proves their accuracy. Well, let's see. Living mollusk shells were carbon dated 2,300 years old. They're still alive. Science volume 141. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Antarctic Journal, September. Uh, by fre shells, from fresh, uh, shells from living snails were carbon dated 27,000 years old. Well, that's accurate. This guy said, if a C-14 date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it's not entirely contradicting, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. <laughs> Anthropological Journal of Canada, volume 19, said, no matter how useful it is, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of yielding accurate and reliable results. There are gross discrepancies. The chronology is uneven and relative. The accepted dates are actually selected dates. This whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. It all depends upon which funny paper you read. One part of a mammoth dated 29,000 years old, another part of the same animal is 44,000 years old. Man, you, you talk about a slow birth. <laughs> Dima, well, I told you I need six minutes, but that's okay. We got plenty more. Get video number seven right out there. Thank you so much. <laughs> I did, in fact, extend to six minutes because it is a common complaint of all debaters that they are cut off too early. And you will have six minutes as well. Uh, uh, Kyle Frazier, you're up next. Are you with me? Are there? <laughs> Have I mentioned yet how what a hard thing this is to do? <laughs> it seemed to me like I did that a minute ago. Well, here I am back again, and um, I'm having to put together some stray thoughts. And like Brother Hoven, I'm sure it's a it's kind of like hitting a moving target. You know, it, it, you don't know where you're going. But what I would like to do is take a quick look at one of the comments that, that Brother Hoven made, and that is is that his God is powerful enough to do anything. And I think we need to be careful with that type of Aquinas logic. I do agree that God has ultimate power. In other words, that he is the most powerful of any conceivable being in the universe. But we have to be careful of appuning to God the capacity to do things that he has not claimed. We have to be careful about ascribing to God things that he cannot do. Could he make a stick with only one end? No, a stick has two ends on it. It's because that's a logical contradiction for God to do something like that. Can he make a rock that he couldn't lift? Okay. No, it's a logical contradiction for God to do something like that. And so we need to be careful of ascribing to God those things that he has not claimed. And so when I take a look at how powerful God is, and, and Brother Hovind says his God is powerful enough to do it in six days, and that my God is inept because I claim a God that did it in 17 billion years, I have to, I, I have to say, well, then why not um, seven nanoseconds? Or why didn't he just do it instantly? Boom. Because... It, for whatever reason, in the chronology that's described in the scriptures, it follows a sequence. And the writers of the chronology put some devices on it for us to remember. My particular belief is, is that those devices were terms. Those particular terms included the word day, yom. It's perfectly consistent within the scriptures to interpret the, the day or the term day as a 12-hour period, a 24-hour period, or a long period of time. Elsewhere through Genesis, for example, the, 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 the term day is used in, in reference to the harvest time. Or, you know, we might say Abraham Lincoln in his day. It's a natural thing for us to use termino terminology like that. It's used throughout the scriptures in many, many multiple of occasions, and it's not wrong for us to take it in this context. Why is it then that I have chosen to take the context somewhat differently than the one that seems to show the most powerful God? Because as I showed earlier, I am working from what is called a dual, a, a dual revelational paradigm. The dual revelational paradigm believes that God put his truth in place and that it's true in both places. That he put nature in place and he communicates from us truly with nature. He put his word in place, and he communicates with us truly in his word. And I believe you occasionally have to set the two of those side by side, and that you have to use a systematic theology to look at those things and say, if nature is saying this, if the word is saying this, 
Um, and if there is an apparent contradiction, do we reconcile it? Or do we walk away from it? I believe that it's necessary for us to, to make that reconciliation. Because if we don't make that reconciliation, what we have, in effect, is a universe that sent us light over 17 billion light years away. It is moving away from us, as Dr. Hoven has suggested. And since it is moving away from us, it's expanding. And that light has gotten to us after about 17 billion years, and we're observing it now. For us to have observed it any sooner than that, either the events on the outside edge of that um, travel never occurred or were fictitiously made by God for us to observe them that way, or they actually happened at that distance and that amount of time away from us. I believe that God commu communicates his word in truth. There are numerous examples of this. I could list just a few, Psalms 104, Psalms 139, Job 38, 41. But my need is to, is to take a look at this concept of a long day. The first chapter of Genesis declares that within six days, God's miraculously transformed a formless void, the earth, into a suitable habitat for mankind. The meaning for day here has become the center of controversy. Does it or does it not make for a conflict between the scripture and science? The answer to that depends upon whether the time periods indicated are 24 hours or in the order of millions of years. Many scientists and many Bible scholars would agree that the correct and literal interpretation for the creation day is one that takes into account definitions, context, grammar, and relevant passages and other parts of Scripture. All we're trying to do is take a systematic approach to this. In fact, one of the problems I have with the, the approach to the Scriptures that take one verse out of a, a, a series and apply it to all of our life is the failure to do a, a systematic approach to the Scriptures. Because you see, even the Scriptures on occasion have items in them that you look at and you say, it, it, said, it just said this, I'll give you an example in Proverbs. Um, uh, do not uh, answer a fool according to his folly or he will despise you. The very next verse it says, answer a fool according to his folly or he will despise you. Are we wrong in taking both of those as correct? Isn't one or the other true? The fact of the matter is, is that the scriptures intend for us to take both as true. And I believe that the scriptures are also saying that we should take nature as true, as well as the scriptures. And the unfortunate problem with not doing that is that you have circular reasoning. Perhaps I'll be able to get back to this in a moment. But if you take one form of, ins of inspir inspiration and you say it alone carries the whole weight of the argument, you, you have it confirming that in itself. Do you see that as to be circular reasoning? Anyway. My time's up. Thank, Thank you, you Cobb. Michael Sherman. Okay, now look. <laughs> I, uh, I really like what Kyle had to say. He's very thought, thoughtful on his thoughts on the Bible. I, I, I concur with much of that, actually. And, and Dr. Hovine, I have never heard somebody give a two-hour lecture in 15 minutes like you can. You, you, <laughs> your law students would have fun taking notes from this guy. <laughs> Get that tape recorder handy. Um, Ken says I should be skeptical of evolution. Well, I used to be. I was. I was a total skeptic of evolution. I didn't believe it. I didn't for years, for a long time. I read all, you know, all the creationist literature. I read what the creationists said was evolution, and I didn't believe it because it sure didn't make sense. Then I actually took some courses in the science of evolutionary biology, and I found out, oh, well, this is nothing what the creationists were saying that it was. This is like a science. This is a whole different thing. This isn't anything what I was told. Then I realized, okay, this is, these are two different things. Science is different than religion. It's a whole different way of thinking. It's a different way of analyzing the world. It's, it's just, they're, they're really quite different fields of knowledge. And I found out I was making a huge mistake when I attempted to completely overlap them and use one to prove the other. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> so I then became, as it were, a believer in evolution, although, although belief isn't even the right word. You don't believe in evolution. It, it either is or it isn't, based on the evidence. It's not an article of faith. Which brings me to the subject of, is evolution a religion? Look, if evolution is a religion, by which I presume 
Dr. Hoving means evolutionary theory and the science, not the process itself. If that's a religion, then everything's a religion. Human history, the study of human history is a religion. Archaeology is a religion. Paleontology is a religion. These, this sort of cheapens what we mean by religion. A religion is a community of believers that serves a social and moral purpose in society. Its purpose is not to test empirical hypotheses. That's what science does. And science has been really good at that. And that's why in the last 400 years, science and religion have largely separated as two spheres or magisteria of, of, of looking at the world. Um, not all religions require belief in a deity, but most do, and certainly evolution doesn't. Dr. Hoving put up a long laundry list of scientists who are creationists. So what? I can give up a, a laundry list of theologians and deeply religious people, born again, who believe evolution. What, what does this mean? It doesn't mean anything. That's not how we operate in science. We don't go by, based on how many big name people believe it. That's not how science works. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter if nobody believes evolution. It either happened or it didn't. Uh, and for the record, by the way, the last survey on this was that 40% of American scientists believe in God. So either, and, and, and virtually all of them believe in evolution. So either they're all idiots, or it's okay to believe in evolution and believe in God. It, it certainly appears to be, since most of them do. Okay, now the question is, I have for Dr. Hoving, uh, or, or even for Kyle as well. Um, if God did it, aren't you curious how she did it? Thank you. I, just, I didn't expect that from this group. Okay, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, in science, we just want to answer questions about the natural world. So if God did the fine-tuning of the universe or did this with the protons and electrons or did this with the whale flipper or whatever, how did God do it? Did God use genes? Did he use for the cosmos stuff the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force? Just gravity, some other force we don't know about. What force did God use? As soon as you ask that question, you're now doing science. That's what science is. It's just naturalism. And there's only naturalism. The rest is supernaturalism. That's not science. You can do that in religion if you want, but that's not science. As soon as you step out of that, you're not doing science anymore. The geological column, by the way, is quite real. In fact, it was laid down and discovered and described by creationists long before the century before Darwin. So don't let Dr. Hoven fool you to thinking that this is some concoction, conspiracy by evolutionists. It's not. The geological column was created, well, discovered by, by uh, creationists. That's, that's not what you think it is. It's creationists created it. Finally, what is the Bible? What is the Bible? Are we to read the Bible as a book of nature? Are you really supposed to read this to find out how the universe began? Are you supposed to read it to find out exactly which deck the predators were on and the prey were on on the ark? I mean, two of every species, there's somewhere between 10 and 40 million species. Where, where did he put all these? And, and who cleaned up the mess anyway at the end of the day? And what did they feed them? If you're asking those kinds of questions, you're missing the point of the Bible, one of the great books of Western literature. You're missing the point if you're doing all this, what I would call pseudoscience. The point of the Bible, like let's say take the flood myth, for example, and by myth I mean a story, is it, it's a destruction redemption. It's a starting over. It's a beginning anew. It's we screwed up, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna start over. All the stories in the Bible are moral homilies and tales that tell that surely you don't want to take Deuteronomy and its admonitions to uh, kill disobedient children. Surely you don't want to take that literally. Please tell me you don't take that literally. Or that adulterous women should be killed. Please tell me you don't take that literally. And if you don't, then you don't take the Bible literally. Al. Thank you. Um. I can understand losing your faith, Michael, but what were they teaching about systematic theology at Pepperdine? Because you missed the whole New Covenant thing. Um, what? I have a 
question now. The, no, no, no. Moderator gets to break in here. What we're going to do is I'm going to give a question to each member of the panel. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back and allow you to recalibrate. But uh, I didn't come all the way across from California not to ask questions. Um, Michael, what did you say were the percentage of scientists who are believers in God? Did you say 70%? 40%. 4-0? 4-0. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just didn't hear that, and I wanted to know that. Uh, Dr. Hovind, my question for you. What did Jesus say about this subject in the Gospels? Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, and in Mark 10, 6, that the creation of Adam was the beginning. I believe that is literally true and scientifically accurate. And the implication for this conversation? These two guys are wrong. I'm right. But I scored Michael on his systematic theology, and, and again, I'll, I'll wager there are some here that would like a little expansion on that, because it, it does seem to me to be quick and not persuasive of someone who might be doubting your point of view. Which, which, which part? <laughs> the, what Jesus has to say about this, Adam, say it again, doctor. Matthew 19, 4, Mark 10, 6, both are very clear. Jesus was talking about marriage and divorce, but he said, Have you not read that he which made them in the beginning, at the beginning, made them male and female? The Bible says very clearly there was no death until Adam sinned. To claim there was death before sin, you but now that, have that, I was just asking about Jesus. Your, your proof text from I'm telling, Jesus I'm telling you. Yeah. is that. Kyle. What does Jesus say about this debate? Uh, I'd have to, hello? Testing, testing. I'd, I'd have to be honest to say that I never really considered that passage in the context, and, and I'm really big on putting passages in the context. So rather than just drawing it out, I would have to say that I see the creation of man as the finish of the sixth creation. Uh, uh, just the lawyer in me just saying, I just, just a question. Jesus okay. is quiet on this subject? Jesus... Um, the creation epic was completed with the... Time out. Just advent. quiet on... He didn't say when it was... He, he had a text. Are there any? I'm not trying to trick you. I'm just wondering. I thought you wanted me to comment on his text. No, no. Just, is, there, is there a phrase in the New Testament? Is there a question and answer? Is there a conversation with the Pharisees on this subject matter? None that I'm aware of. So now my question to three of you. With 40% of your colleagues, Michael, knowing something you don't know, and one verse... From Matthew and no verses from it. Why does this debate matter to you three so much that you give so much time to it? And I'm very sincere about this because I don't spend any time on this at all as a believer. <laughs> Dr. Kent. Okay. Uh, well, you should see what Jesus said about lawyers. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I think this subject is absolutely the most important subject in the world. I travel, I speak seven or eight hundred times a year. Uh, this is my 60, 76th flight this year already. I take this extremely seriously. The question is very simple. How do we tell right from wrong? But we could get into a discussion of all kinds of moral issues. You know, is adultery right or wrong? Is abortion right or wrong? Is murder right or wrong? It, you know, it doesn't matter what subject you discuss. Before you start a discussion on a moral issue, you first have to decide how you decide. Do we decide right and wrong based upon majority opinion? Do we decide right and wrong based upon what Congress thinks? Do we decide right and wrong based upon what Saddam Hussein thinks? How do we decide right from wrong? The issue to me is this creation versus evolution issue is absolutely central to all of humanity. Because if there's a God, then he tells us what's right and wrong. If there is no God, there is no possible way to tell right from wrong. And I would challenge the evolutionists. So, I would, I would, I've challenged, I've asked this question to hundreds of evolutionists, and I'll ask it again tonight. If evolution is true, how do we tell right from wrong? Very simple. Well, um, in, in case, hello, you with me? Okay. Uh, in case I haven't mentioned yet, I do not believe in evolution. I'm just a person who believes that God's creation timeline took longer uh, than six literal days. Um, and this issue is important to me because, of, because there are people like Michael Shermer. Uh, there's a world out there who are struggling... <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't want to typify you. I don't doubt that he's, I don't want to typify him as a struggling person, but I just want to say that there are people out there who, uh, who are, 
are looking for an answer. I came to, I might as well mention that I also started out, uh, first of all, I started out like Michael Shermer, an evolutionist. I then became a theistic evolution because I thought, well, the Genesis 1 record really seems to corroborate with the evolutionary evidence. I worked my way up to Brother Hovind's view where I followed uh, Dr. Gish and, um, and others like him, Dr. Morris, and believe very strongly in what they had to say because it corroborated with the Bible. But it wasn't until I came to this point that where I realized that God can do something in a longer period of time if he wants to, and it could correspond to what the revelation in nature shows me has happened, that I believe that both of my, my belief in God and my understanding of science became real to me. And that has to happen because if you take to, if you throw out one half of it and say, well, nature just lied to us. It, everybody, in, everybody seems to think that it's 17 billion years, but it's really not. We know the Bible is true. I know the Bible is true. I know that nature said something reliable too. It says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their, their words to the end of the world. It transcends language. It sits out there. You go out tonight when you leave here. If you wonder if God can communicate and you look up at the skies and you watch what he's stretched out before you, it's from God. Michael. Well, I'm interested in the subject because uh, what's not to be interested in? You'd have to be made of wood not to be interested in the question of where we came from. So in my books and here and so forth, it's an intellectual journey. I think the, the journey itself, the process of thinking for yourself and thinking it through and listening to all the different theories and opinions and so on, that's where the action is, is trying to figure it out yourself. And um, I guess my take-home message is, you know, it's okay not to believe if you don't or if you have some doubts or whatever, it's not going to kill you. It won't. It's okay. You can always reconvert tomorrow, if, just in case. <laughs> uh, I figure, you know, since I really did believe, and I, I really did, I was very serious about this, you know, I figure I'm in there just in case I'm wrong now. Uh, maybe it's a sort of a way station somewhere. I, I, there's different versions of this. I ask believers if I'm in there, if, just in case. Um, I do think that um, there's something... Um, I think deep within us that wants to know for whatever reason we have a big enough cortex to think about these huge questions and try to answer them. So for me, I, I do want to answer the question, where did morals come from if there is no God and how can you be good without God, which is the subject of my next book called Why We Are Moral. And uh, I, I, what could be more interesting than that? This is a hard scientific question to answer and I'm working on it. Don't worry, you're not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> It is 8.20. We will return here at 8.40 for part two. During the break, I was approached by one of you. What denomination do you belong to and why? I said, I am a Presbyterian for many reasons, but it is primarily the church in which I am least likely to be hugged. Please keep that in mind after <laughs> the break. Um, I was also, my dear friend Judge Anderson is here from your Court of Appeals. And uh, he stood up, he's the only other lawyer here, and, uh, and he averred as how perhaps you had sprayed for lawyers tonight, and uh, we're feeling very alone. Where are the rest of our panelists, if we can have Dr. Hoven and uh, Dr. Shermer come back out? Or maybe not. <laughs> Kyle, you get all 30 minutes. Now, uh, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to assign... Ten minutes, we discussed this, an iterative process, big word meaning we're just making it up as we go along. And ten minutes to each to hit the central points of their presentation. And then, uh, using, I'll do my Oprah. If you have a question, and I emphasize, a question involves an inquiry, not a statement, not a speech. We'll do three questions at a time and allow the panel to choose the one that most interests them. So it's kind of, um, what's that show? Uh, well, you get thrown out when you're very boring and uninteresting. If your question doesn't make it, don't blame me. Uh, Michael Shermer, you're going to go first. Ten minutes. Uh, 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 you, you missed the huddle up back there. So, Are you ready, doctor? Go ahead.
There, did I get it on? Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Well, these could go forever. Let me just share with you a few of the things that are typically used to support the evolution theory and how they've simply been proven wrong. It was mentioned tonight, I didn't get time to type, I typed about nine words a minute, so I didn't get time to get it down, but about there's, you know, there's evidence for this evolution that, you know, that we have evolved from some other type of creature. All the evidence that I'm aware of, and I taught biology for 15 years, all the evidence that's used to support this theory has been proven wrong. And I think these lies ought to be torn out of our textbook, okay? If you have evidence for your theory, show me, okay? Now, <clears throat> this textbook says the humans have an appendix that is vestigial. You don't need it anymore. Well, that's simply a lie. You need your appendix as part of your immune system. Now, if, if your appendix is taken out, you can still live, but you've got a much better chance of getting quite a few diseases, okay? The appendix is part of the immune system, and the fact that you can live without it is meaningless. You can live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes and both your ears also. Okay, that doesn't prove you don't need it. When you take it out, you've got a better chance of getting all sorts of diseases. We cover that in video four. This textbook says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. This is a lie. Uh, Andrew Carnegie founded the group called the National Center for Science Education. He was a strong believer in evolution, and he applied it to the business world. The strongest survive. You wipe out the competition. Andrew Carnegie funded the National Center for Science Education. National Center. Yeah, I had all four of them in this little storefront building. The National Center. They say, Bossy evolved to blowhole. The whale evolved from a cow. That's what they teach. This one says, Whales have a vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. Whales have hind limb bones that have no function. Just imagine whales walking around, it's true. Well, these are the bones they're talking about right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. <laughs> the whale's pelvis has no apparent function. This is in textbooks all over the world, okay? The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. This is simply a lie, okay? Those little bones hold certain muscles that allow the whales to reproduce. This has nothing to do with the whale walking on land. It has to do with getting more baby whales. Tear that page out of the book, please. I have in my museum in Pensacola, Florida, a 15 and a half foot skin from an albino python. Down at the south end of that python, you'll see it has two little tiny claws, one here and one here. These claws are attached to little tiny bones. They go up inside the snake's body. 15 and a half foot snake with bones about two and a half inches long. This textbook says the python has reduced hind legs, rudimentary hind legs of a python snake. This is baloney, okay? Those little claws are part of the snake's mating apparatus. They, they don't have any arms, they can't hang on, they don't have a voice box, they can't say, scoot over, honey. This has nothing to do. <laughs> this one says, humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. I did a debate in North Alabama against the president of the North Alabama Atheist Association. He said, we've got proof for evolution. Humans have a tailbone they no longer need. I said, Mr. Patterson, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. <laughs> I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. I said, now, if you think the tailbone is vestigial, then I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. This textbook says, the coccyx is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function and is thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree-living ancestor. This is a lie, okay? You could use a tailbone if you had one. Okay, the tailbone is not vestigial. There are no vestigial organs, and if there were, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. This textbook says humans evolved from an ape-like ancestor. Every one of these along the way has been proven wrong, and once again, even if you could find fossils that we couldn't prove what they were, that wouldn't be evidence for evolution. You don't know those bones had any kids. So what about these cavemen? I mean, can an ape-like creature turn to a human? There's the world, <laughs> world's most wanted caveman. We could spend six days on this one. Every one of the so-called cavemen has been proven wrong. They're simply not correct, and we, they should be taken out of the book. This 2001 textbook says, the horse evolved from a four-toed ancestor. This has been proven wrong years ago. Back in 1950, G.G. G. Simpson said, he was a famous evolutionist, many examples such as the evolution of the horse family have been unintentionally falsified. The early classical evolutionary tree of the horse was all wrong. 1951, this has been proven wrong 50 years ago. Get that out of the book, okay? It's not true. He said it never happened in nature. Similar, humans and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. This idea that the human has gill slits is taught in textbooks all over the world. 
It's, let's see, the presence of fish-like structures shows that these animals have evolved from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. It said it has gills like a fish. This is used in textbooks all over. Those are not gill slits. Those folds of skin develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen people with five or six chins and they cannot breathe through any of them but the top one, okay? <laughs> Ernst Haeckel made up this entire stupid idea after he read Darwin's book in 1860. He, took a, he was an embryology professor in Germany, so he took a drawing of a dog and a human embryo and he changed them and made them look alike. He lied deliberately to his people that were listening to him. He made giant charts of his fake drawings, traveled all over Germany, and converted the Germans to believing in evolution with his fake drawings. Now on top are his drawings, underneath are actual photographs of those creatures. Either he's a real lousy artist or he's a liar. Well, it turns out he's a liar. His own university convicted him of fraud. He said, I should feel condemned, except all the other biologists lie. So it's okay for me to lie. This biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail. It's not true. Take it out of the book. But guess what? It's still used in textbooks all over the world, including in this county. They're still teaching it. Proven wrong in 1875, and they're still teaching it all over the world. Now look, if you have some evidence for evolution, then please show me. We've been offering a quarter million dollars for evidence for evolution for 10 years now. All they have to support their theory are lies, things that have been proven wrong a long time ago. We could spend, we do spend three hours on videotape number four, and I'm going to cover some of this tomorrow, some of the lies in the textbooks. They say this, you know, a similar structure proves a common ancestor. The bones in the different arms of these animals develop from different genes on the chromosome. They're not homologous structures. And the similar, similarity could prove they have a common designer just as easily. This is a chart showing how the atheists think the different states are treating the subject of evolution. They think the folks in Minnesota are doing a wonderful job of teaching evolution. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to get red like Florida. We're doing a lousy job. Yay, Florida. <laughs> Richard Dawkins said, it's absolutely safe to say if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. Well, he's real open-minded, isn't he? <laughs> Evolution's a f not a fact. It's not even a good theory. Evolution's a religious hypothesis. People believe that the animals change. But nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. Now, I think two things. Number one, the lies should be taken out of the books, period. Don't lie to the kids. And then I think you'll find there is simply is no evidence to support this evolution hypothesis, okay? And that's their problem. If you don't have any evidence for your theory, I'm sorry. I mentioned in a debate one time about 30 different lies in the textbooks, and this one professor said, Hoven, you want to take all these lies out of the books, and I've got a question for you. What are you going to replace it with? <laughs> I was in a, speaking at the University of West Florida, my hometown, just about a year ago. One professor got up in the audience during Q&A time, and he said, Hoven, you mentioned tonight we should tear the pages out of the book. He said, I don't think we should deface textbooks. I said, well, sir, suppose you were teaching math and you came across a book that said 2 plus 2 is 5. What would you do? He said, I would tell my students to mark out the wrong answer and write in the right answer. Oh, you would deface a textbook? <laughs> I said, now, sir, since you do teach biology, suppose you come across a book that says the embryo has gill slits or the tailbone is vestigial. What are you going to do? He said, nothing. I said, you're not going to tell the kids that's been proven wrong years ago? He said, no. I said, then you, sir, are a hypocrite, and the folks in this state ought to help you get an honest job picking peaches or changing tires, but you got no business using tax dollars to spread your lies on these kids coming to your class. <laughs> Thomas Huxley was called Darwin's bulldog. He really pr pr uh, promoted Darwin. His grandson, Julius Huxley, said, I suppose the reason we leapt at the origin of species, the reason we believed in evolution, was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. Ooh, now we got the truth coming out. Some people just don't like God telling them what to do. That's the bottom line. Well, listen, you do whatever you want with your life, but you're going to stand before that same God one of these days and be judged for everything you've ever said, thought, or done, whether you like it or not. Now, my recommendation is we get lies out of the textbooks, okay? If you got some evidence for a theory, then show me. But the evolution theory is hiding behind a bunch of lies. That's all there are to support it. And I am on a crusade, one man crusade if necessary, but I'm going to die trying to get honesty in our schools and get the kids to quit being lied to. I think the purpose behind all this... <clears throat> I, think, 
I think that there's a really a spiritual battle at a much higher plane. This is not a science battle. There's no scientific evidence for evolution, and there's no scientific evidence against the Bible. This is a spiritual battle. You ought to get involved. Thank you. Kyle Frazier. Testing, testing. Okay, just making sure I'm with you. Uh, Hugh, just to show how poor I am at paying attention, would you remind me what the agenda is here now? Are we on for 10 minutes and then a question and answer and no closing? Okay. In that case, I'm going to be reading my closing now. It may not have the same effect as it would then, but I believe it will carry over. And my conclusion is this, and I'm going to be sharing the parable of the wall. When I found out I was going to be doing this debate this evening, which was about the same time as uh, we decided bomb, to bomb Iraq, it struck me... Um, the thing, discussions like this need to influence us differently than to come to a point where we're slinging mud, where we're treating people prejudicially, to where we are not looking at truth in the way that we should look at truth. And so I'm going to share with you the parable of the wall. This is the story of three orphaned boys, defend, discover, and discern. One day these three took a walk in the forest behind their orphanage and discovered the most remarkable thing, a beautifully built brick wall. Curious about it, they decided to look it over and found that there was only one simple clue about the purpose in the creator of the wall, a note sitting atop the wall that read, day one, gather materials, day two, level area, day three, poor footing, day four, did I say day four? No, day four, build wall. I'll be back soon, love, father. The discovery created a great deal of excitement with each boy reacting to the discovery in a manner typical with his personality. This is amazing, insisted Defend. Our father has left us a monument to remember him by. No, said Discover. Don't be silly. We don't know if there is any connection between the note and the one who built the wall or if the one who did is our father. In fact, we don't even know if we have the same father. Moreover, I think it's more of an accident than a tribute. What is the purpose of a single wall? It must be the start of something more significant. Discern, trying to moderate the confusion, suggested that this could be the most significant find in their lives, but said he wanted more proof. It is an excellent wall, we know. Nothing of our father, whether he was a wall builder, whether we are his offspring, and what is, off, uh, and what is the purpose of this wall? That is all defend and discover needed. They decided and started a passionate search for the evidence of their point. Defend decided to pour himself into studying the note. The following years, he read the note repeatedly for clues that would indicate that the one who wrote the note actually built the wall. He found that the wall building steps were accurate. The conclusion, no other option than the builder of the note and the writer were the same person. Being convinced of this, he then set out to prove that his father would be capable of building the wall. He went to public records and found that his father was strong and intelligent and caring. In addition, he spent much of his available time reading every word written about his father. Discover, on the other hand, decides to pour himself into this study of walls. Surely, the better one wall knows walls, the better one will know wall builders. He studies architectural, engineering, and masonry. In the end, he is a world expert. By this time, he decides to reread the note reconsider the note in light of what he learns of walls and finds that there is nothing about the note that necessitates it being built by his father. That's all defend. <clears throat> For his part, discern tries to keep in touch with his brothers, defend and discover. However, the passion of each makes it harder and harder to spend time with them. In addition, he notices that each has become more and more passionate about his position and is now impossible to talk with them without hearing about all their expertise. Discern decides to arrange a meeting between the brothers, reestablish their brotherhood. The meeting, while well-intentioned, quickly dissolves into a shouting match. Defend started with the assurance that his knowledge of the note builder is so intimate, he is convinced that the wall is built by him. In fact, he concludes to him the most important message is that it is the most powerful wall builder ever. Discover followed with the details about information about walls. Walls are, the, are, are wonderful, he agreed, and nothing about this particular wall says that it had to be made by the father. To me, the most important thing is that given enough time, practically anyone could have built this wall. Ridiculous, retorts Defend. Fathers as skilled as ours could not only build a wall of perfect, but made it in four days, just like the note said. He is not a typical father, and this is no typical wall. My father and your father are clearly not the same. Discern thinking he can find blind spots, and each brother argue, tries to build a bridge, saying, perhaps each of you were not so close to what the others learned. You might find common ground, but quickly finds neither brother respects his attempt at neutrality. Defend claims he is ignorant of the father, and discern claims he is ignorant about walls. Sadly, the brothers part ways and remain distant for the years to follow. I'm sorry I'm having to read this. This is really only the second time I've gone over this since I wrote it, so please be patient with me. Amazingly, one day, 
Each receives a letter from the trustee of the father's estate. The father has been discovered. He will be reading of the will. Each of the boys is an heir. They gather at the attorney's office and in the excitement of the moment, forget their differences. They embrace and apologize for being so distant. After all, if they are heirs, they are brothers too. The, at the appropriate time, the trustee opens the letter and slowly reads. To my three sons, defend, discover, and discern. I leave all my earthly possessions. May they manage them with care and wisdom and with the brotherhood they learned by working together to finish the small brick clubhouse I started for them on the back of my property. May the love I have shown them cause them to love one another. <clears throat> You see, the father wanted to build brothers and not walls. That's my ten minutes. Thank you, Kyle. Michael, ten minutes is what we agreed when you were at front. Ten, min ten minutes. Okay, how's that? Oh, how are we doing up there in the balcony? Yay. Wow. All right, I want to do two things in my 10 minutes, five each. Um, addressing some of the claims by Dr. Hoveen that scientists are liars and they knowingly lie to students and perpetrate lies in textbooks. Have I characterized that correctly? So the question is, is, is this true? Is this actually true? Are some scientists liars and they perpetrate lies, knowingly lying to people? Is this really true? The answer is no, it's not. Mistakes are made, as all humans do. You're the ones that talk about sin and so forth. Mistakes are perpetrated quite by accident and Usually, in fact, all of the examples that Dr. Hoving gave, and, and that's only a handful. There's lots more mistakes that get published in textbooks. Um, all of them, without exception, I haven't found one, was discovered by other scientists, not by creationists. The scientists themselves nail each other on these things. That's one of the beautiful self-correcting natures of science. In terms of like Heckel's famous embryological drawings, he was nailed in his own time for this. Then how did it end up in textbooks? You will never find any of the examples that Dr. Hoven gave in scientific papers or monographs or professional books by scientists for other professionals. Then how is it these things survive in textbooks? The problem is not of science. The problem is textbook publishing. And the problem is not just science, it's in all the sciences. It's in history books. It's in all textbooks. The reason is, is because, well, this is a whole other issue, but it has nothing to do with science. It has to do with textbook publishers and uh, uh, just sort of not checking their facts, or they hire fact checkers that are not qualified to do this. It's a serious problem, but it's an educational problem, not a scientific one. When the errors are discovered, they are taken out. You won't find Heckel's drawings anywhere in modern textbooks published in the last few years. You won't find it anymore, along with any of the other errors he brought up. And in any case, the point is, is that this is what scientists do. And frankly, I resent the use of the word liar. I think it's a low blow. I think it's a rhetorical, sneaky trick on the part of a propagandist, not a man interested in science and truth. The second half, to turn on the PowerPoint here, I just want to make a few words, uh, say a few words about, um, about religion and, and just plant this little seed. Um, because we're being told by Dr. Hoven in particular that the Christian story in particular is, is absolutely true in its veracity and has scientific evidence to support it. I believe that. One of the things that led me away from belief in that was the realization that these stories are not original to Christian stories or to the Bible. For example, in the first century AD, living in Asia Minor, there was a man named Apollonius of Tyana. His followers claimed he was the son of God, that he was able to walk through closed doors, heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise the dead girl back to life. He was accused of witchcraft, sent to Rome before the count, 
was jailed but escaped. After he died, his followers claimed he appeared to them and then ascended to heaven. This is a classic story. It's the Isis Osiris story. Osiris story. It's the, it's the destruction, redemption, flood myth that I told you about. It's the starting over. This three days and coming back. This is found in lots of cultures. It's not original to the Christian story. Next slide. You see, in fact, the evidence that God and religion, if I'm going to say something in positive, then where, where does the concept of God come from? Uh, it's, hum it's humanly constructed. I mean, how many of you, we had a, a show of hands or we had everybody stand up that believe in, God, how many of you believe in Zeus? Okay, so you're Zeus atheists. We had one hand up here. Okay, all right, well, <laughs> God bless her or whoever. <laughs> uh, so you're all Zeus atheists. In fact, there's been roughly 10,000 different gods and 10,000 different religions in the last 10,000 years, rough order of magnitude. I contend that all of you are atheists for 9,999 of those gods. The only difference between me and you is just that one other god. That's it. That's the only difference. Next slide. So, for example, there's lots of creation myths. The, 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 there's lots of them. Which of these, Dr. Hovind, should we teach in public schools or, or in any schools? The no creation story from India, the slain monster creation story from Sumeria, Babylonia, the primordial parents creation stories from the Zuni Indians, sorry, uh, the cosmic egg creation story from Japan, the world was created from an egg, from primordial parents, from a slain monster, uh, the spoken Edi creation story from the Mayans, Egyptians, and Hebrews. The world sprang into being at the command of a god. This one's yours. The, no creation, uh, the sea creation stories. The world was created out of the sea or water, oceans, lakes, something like that. Next slide. Um, in fact, flood myths are culturally constructed. We know over the last roughly 2,000 to 1,800 years before Christ, the famous Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, this predates the Noachian flood story. Flood stories are common to cultures that live on bodies of water that flood. Now, does this make your flood story false? My contention is that to ask whether the flood actually happened or not is to miss the point of the story. You miss the point. All these stories, the point isn't whether they're true or not. The point is what's the message behind it. So I would suggest you read the Bible in a different way. What are these stories trying to tell us? Really geological Scientific knowledge, really, is that what they're trying to tell us? Or might there be something a little deeper in the message? Let's go to the next slide. There is evidence, in fact, that uh, from brain research that uh, you can stimulate certain parts of the brain. People hear the voice of God. They see God. They hear angels. They talk to angels. You can stimulate different parts of the body. They have out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences. So the belief in God, the construction of religion, is social, cultural, psychological, and so forth. This doesn't mean it's absolutely not true. Maybe there's people that do this research that are believers claim that this is God's way of communicating with us. Okay, maybe. But let's not just be simplistic and say it's black and white, these people are liars, and we're right. The real story is more subtle, more sophisticated, and more complex than that. And I would ask you to think for yourself, do a little reading, do a little expansion of your, of your thinking uh, along these lines, and see what else is out there. Thank you. Here's how we propose to handle the questions. I will borrow one of the handheld mics here. We have two rows here. And uh, please come and form up if you have a question for our panel. And as I said, we will take three questions at a time and allow our individuals to do. I also agree with Michael, especially for the young people here. You must do your reading, especially Josephus and Tacitus, as the Romans recorded that there was a man named Jesus and he was crucified in 33 AD. I just want to make sure that we do not confuse the myth of Gilgamesh with that. Um, <laughs> I just, just a little history, just a little history, just the facts, yeah, three in a row. You're the moderator, you're the moderator, you're just not the supposed facts. to join in against me. I already have 3,000 people against me, you. <laughs> you're supposed to be neutral. I just like to bring no, that no, to no, the No, 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 no. Just a question, no statements. One quick statement, Dr. Uh, I, I am on your side. Okay, okay. I got quick, quick question. Uh, your statement about 10,000 gods over the 10,000 years. Yeah, um, it's probably more than that. but Probably pretty well proves the point that there is the one true God because there's six billion of us who believe in him. But where is the body of Christ? We had the Jews and the Romans both 
that had an interest in keeping it in the grave, it's not there. Okay, How do you know? question. Let's oh, get three in a row. Three questions, sorry. Judge? Can you uh, assess the present state of scientific evidence relative to carbon dating and other methods of determining passage of time? And the third. Um, there was a statement about the some, like, dimensional bubble or something like that, that there could be an infinite number of those. Well, if there is a dimensional bubble, what's beyond that? Or <laughs> And if there is something, what's beyond that? Dr. Hoven, respond to any or all of those three that you would like. <laughs> Whatever you'd like. Okay, did I get my mic on? Okay. Um, the body of Christ, of course, you're very right, had a... Uh, Many people had an interest in making sure that was never seen. People were, they put a, actually sealed the tomb and put a guard there. I think that it's very evident that uh, Jesus did rise from the dead. There were well over 500 witnesses. If you look at the change in the disciples, when they're standing under, at the foot of the cross, they're scared stiff, they're running and hiding. You know, they're scared they're going to lose their life. A couple of days later, these are, the, these are the bravest men in the world. There was an incredible change in their life. If you look at the historical evidence, you'll say, man, Christ rose from the dead. I think you'd find many millions of people today, including probably a few thousand in this room, who will testify that the same Jesus Christ has changed their life. Um, Kyle. <laughs> Kyle. Your response to any of those inquiries. Yeah. Hello. Are you with me? Okay. Uh, I think I would take a stab at the uh, bubbles universe, the multiple universe, the contingency of that, and the real problem with that that what you find is, is that when I put up my argument that the universe came into being, even if it was 17 billion years ago, that leaves too little time to evolve Earth, life on the Earth. And so um, a lot of scientists then are appealing to other, um, what they call science, but quite candidly, you'll have to admit they're, they're no more credible than a blind leap of faith in, in God. If, if you do throw out a model that says we need multiple universes in order to create life because... Any one lot universe needs to be so finely tuned as to pop into being so that life can be here in a very short period of time on whatever scale you use. It won't happen unless you appeal to multiple universes. But then you have what's called the gambler's fallacy. And that is that if a gambler was sitting in a room and watching um, a, a man toss a coin and he tossed it 10,000 times, then it always came up heads. You have to ask the gambler, is he going to take a bid on the next toss that it's going to come up tails and the gambler may say well yes I will and then you'll say what are you basing that upon if he says well it's because I believe that there were another 210,000 coins tossed outside of this auditorium they had something different than these and these all came up heads I'm betting that puppy's going to come up tails he's betting on a lot of different odds and that's the problem with ap appealing to bubble universes additional universes coming into being Michael, your choice of uh, comments. Are we on here yet? Okay, I think this, is this the young man here that asked the question? No, he sat oh. down. Oh, it, it's a great question. It's, gosh, I, you know, if my 11-year-old asked that, I, I, you know, this would be wonderful. You know, your brain is engaged. Uh, because that is one of the hard problems. But, it, but, but the problem exists whether you have one universe expanding or multiple universes or, or even if there's a God. You just simply ask, well, what's beyond that? And we have the capacity to ask that. But we can't really answer it because, in a way, the universe, when, when it's expanding, when the universe began and it's expanding, it's not expanding into anything. It is the space and time at, as it expands. It is everything. There, you can't even ask the question. It's like asking what's north of the North Pole. It's, it's a nonsensical question. It's unfortunate, but it's true whether it's true if you're a theist too. What's beyond God? Who made God? These are infinite kind of questions that we can't really ask. And on the other, the Christ body thing, and people, you know, gave their lives. I'm always amazed by this argument that uh, the Christians use. I mean, um, look at Marshall Applewhite. He convinced 39 hardcore disciples to take their lives to go to the UFO behind Jupiter uh, by committing suicide. Did Jim Jones got 900 people to kill themselves, and so on. Followers do this. They're true believers. That's Michael, what true believers do. Carbon dating. Cur oh, the carbon, for, the carbon dating was the. Uh, um, there are error bars in the carbon dating. It varies, maybe about 10 to 12 percent on any given date, but it's fairly accurate. They got much better at it now. You can use smaller samples. It's pretty accurate. Dr. Hogan. On carbon dating. Carbon dating. 
I think it's ridiculous. I think it was invented in 1950. We Willard Libby, University of Chicago, got a Nobel Prize for it, moved on to Stanford University. Uh, way before that, in 1830, the geologic column was developed. Really, the way they tell the age of things is by which position they are in the geologic column. They date the fossils by which layer they come from. Then they turn around and date the layers by which type of fossils are found in them. Circular reasoning. We'll cover that tomorrow in the seminar if you want to come. Um, <laughs> all right. Good enough. Three questions. Question mostly for uh, Mr. Shermer, but for all three. What is your greatest motivation for being here, and what do you fear if you didn't, wouldn't have shown up today? Okay. Me? Yeah. I think I'm particularly for Dr. Holovine, but uh, the question I have is if the flood, the cataclysm in 40 days and 40 nights, if during that time he's going to put the trilobites up on, in Sedona and he's going to carve the Grand Canyon, did he do this to confuse us? Good question. Given the various errors that I have experienced in textbooks and uh, contrary to some comments tonight, and the um, omissions of contradictory information to the neo-Darwinistic theory, why shouldn't one believe that these textbooks are written more from a philosophical position rather than from a search for truth? Michael, we'll start with you and move left. Okay. Uh, well, we, we kind of did the why we're here question uh, because I'm curious, like to know. Um, thought I'd see uh, the city where the, that has the team that the Lakers just beat last night. Uh, <laughs> just a gratuitous, just a little, yeah. Hey, but you had us scared for a while there. Uh, no, just because it's, you know, it's fun stuff. Uh, yeah, the Grand Canyon and all this, you know, did God plant the fossils to confuse us? No, it was Satan testing your faith, whatever. You know, yeah, of course, obviously, this is a bit of a problem for believers. Uh, what do you make of all this evidence? Errors and omissions in textbooks, I kind of addressed that uh, in, in my first part of my 10-minute thing. Um, uh, this is a problem, again, not, not, not for science. It's a problem for textbook publishing. Uh, scientists weed these things out. You don't see these errors. They get weeded out very quickly. It's the scientists themselves. If you go to an evolution conference, you're not going to find, like, universal agreement about stuff. You should see these guys going at it. They have all kinds of uh, great battles within evolutionary science. It's really a delight to see. It's nothing like what you think it is. Uh, as outsiders, you know, you've never been to an evolution conference, oh, they must have this sort of uniform religion-like agreement and everything. They don't. They fight over all kinds of things. All right, Kyle? I guess there was applause, but not very much. So you're going to have to do better next time. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. What were the uh, questions again, please? Okay. Okay. Um, any one of them. Okay, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, why? Oh, why anybody's here? That was specifically for you. Yeah, was... Errors and omissions. I think um, I'm going to have to take the a view that co goes kind of with uh, Michael's, and that is that um, you see uh, that knowledge is a construction, that it's a product, that it's a moving target, it's constantly growing. Um, this year, science is going to be something completely different in 200 years. We're going to look back, and you know, I wish I'd put it up there: Jimi Hendrix in bell jeans, and, or blue jeans, or bell-bottom pants and beads and stuff at an afro. You know, knowledge grows just like we change in time. Um, that's why I aim for some universals. I don't just say that nature reveals all of truth; um, that nature, as corrected or understood through the Bible, it reveals the truth. Uh, we, so we don't have a, a complete handle on this. Our textbooks are always going to have errors in them, and we're just going to have to live with that. Dr. Hoven? Uh, I will choose the question, did God deceive us with the Grand Canyon, and that uh, Michael Schimmer's statement that this is a problem for believers. If you built a dam across Grand Canyon, get that projector off there if you would, a uh, huge lake would form. These red lines indicate what's called the snow line. Grand Canyon, 200 miles, cutting across from, uh, from the upper right to the lower left. Grand Canyon, uh, the river enters the canyon at 2,800 feet above sea level. The top of the ridge is seven or 8,000 feet above sea level. So, some things to consider about Grand Canyon. Number one, the top is higher than the bottom. <laughs> Number two, the river only runs through the bottom. Number three, the top is higher than where the river enters the canyon by 4,000 feet. Number four, rivers don't flow uphill. There is no possible way that river made that canyon. Grand Canyon is quite obviously a washed out spillway from a couple of big lakes called Grand Lake and Hopi Lake. The lakes are gone. The beach is still there. No God didn't deceive us. I think he left behind incredible evidence that there was a flood. 
which indicates he judged this world and he's going to judge it again whether you like it or not. Thank you, Doctor. Quick questions, quick answers. If we evolved, then why did we develop sexual reproduction when asexual reproduction is easily achieved? <sighs> Dr. Sherman, I uh, appreciate you uh, explaining that just because we don't find a natural explanation to things, that doesn't mean that uh, there's a divine explanation. But aren't you asking us to accept a theory where we see that goes against what we normally see in nature, that natural systems don't build things up gradually, but break things down. And in addition, we don't have one example, if it did happen, we don't have one example of an organism or an organ or even an organelle of how it formed in a step-by-step -step fashion. Very good. Third one. Dr. Shermer, if you want us to look at the Bible in a different way and see the meaning behind the story, tell me what do you think is the meaning behind Jesus when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. All right, we'll start with Dr. Shermer. Move to the left again. Okay. <laughs> Why is sexual reproduction better than asexual reproduction. Well, young man, <laughs> you're about to find out in a few more years. <laughs> there's, a, there's more jokes in there somewhere. I think there was some crusty old biology professor who asked his students who invented asexual reproduction. They said, your wife. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> anyway, it's uh, We'll be here all week. It's a simple explanation in, in the sense that sexual reproduction produces va variation and natural selection operates on variation. That's what generates change in, in biology. In terms of natural, uh, oh, uh, second law of thermodynamics, things, things run down in nature. How is it you guys can say things get more complex? Because you put energy into the system. The sun generates energy into the system that creates complex systems out of simple systems and so on. You put the burger in the microwave, it heats up and that kind of thing. As for what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and so forth, well, he meant that he is the savior. He meant that he is the guy you should follow. That's what all proselytizers do. That's what all cult leaders do. They have to do that. That's what they do. Kyle? The, the difference between a religion and a cult is about 100 years. Well, we, <clears throat> when we have to look at truth, we have to realize if you took 10,000 people um, who founded religions and you were to pick from one of them, Michael, my question is, which one are you going to pick? And that's why when we take a look at the scriptural sciences and how they s confirm these things, we have to look at does the one then who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, does he say that in a context of a, of a true book that, was, um, that not only recorded the events that he did, but recorded these claims that we've made about the expansion of the universe, its sudden beginning, and entropy in the universe. I believe that Jesus is capable of validating um, uh, uh, one particular religion out of the 10,000 by standing behind the truth in the scriptures. Dr. Hovind. I think the uh, Michael Schimmer's answer to the sexual reproduction was uh, definitely not an answer at all. It, his, his statement basically was, it works good to supply variety so natural selection can work on it, therefore it must have evolved. No, no, therefore it was designed, okay? Uh, I would ask a bigger question, why would any animal want to reproduce more of its own kind, which just simply makes more mouths to feed? Why not instead evolve the ability to live forever? That'd be a lot smarter. Um, as far as the second law of thermodynamics, his answer was you add energy. Well, here's Sue at 20. Here she is at 90 after a lot of energy. There she is at 3,000. Uh, the idea of adding energy is absolutely ludicrous, okay? They, this is always the answer, though. They'll say, well, if you add energy, the sun adds energy to the earth. Yes, I know. But the universe is a closed system, so that really begs the question. It only answers it for the earth. Secondly, adding energy is absolutely destructive unless there's a, util a mechanism to utilize the energy. We added quite a bit of energy to Iraq in the last few months. <laughs> um, the Japanese added energy to Pearl Harbor. We added energy to a couple of their cities. Didn't organize a thing, okay? 
The sun adds energy to this earth, all right, but it's going to destroy the roof on your house, not build it. The sun's energy will destroy your house. It'll destroy the roof on your car. It'll destroy your paint job on your car. The sun's energy is destructive to everything except chlorophyll, which is an extremely complex molecule. So the same sun's energy shines on the other planets and doesn't build anything there. I think that to say that you know, adding energy solves the problem is absolutely a simplistic answer and totally devoid of any scientific common sense. It's adding energy is destructive unless there's something to utilize the energy. Three more. That's, that's my final answer. Three more. If God didn't create the world by his knowledge, then where did things learn to do what they do? And where did knowledge come from? Um, I understand the need to understand the Bible is true, but how is it critical to believe in evolution, to believe in Jesus as my personal savior? My question is about uh, the miracle that happened with Adam and Eve and the rib being broken off the man. Is that true that we only have half a rib? Dr. Hoven, let's start with you and move to the right this time. I will not have time to get PowerPoint ready for this one, but uh, no, man does not have an extra rib. There is only one bone in the human body that will grow back if you take it out, and that is the lower rib. Uh, there's a good article about that. Uh, you can see in my videotape number two, and I cover that, uh, the blue one out there on the table. Uh, I didn't get time to even write down the other two questions, uh, so I guess I'll just, let's see. Oh, help yourself. Yeah, yeah. You took notes. Good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> critical, uh, critical to abandon Can you read evolution. that? Why should he abandon evolution? In okay. Uh, why should he abandon evolution? Uh, there is absolutely no scientific evidence that says a dog ever came from a non-dog or a dog's capable of producing a non-dog. There's no evidence for evolution at all. So why on earth would you compromise a perfectly good Bible which has never been proven wrong with a dumb theory that's never been proven right? I right, Leave it alone. <laughs> I don't know that I clearly understood the question, and somebody is going to have to clarify it for us. What does it mean? Um, where did people learn, or how do we learn? Uh, knowledge? knowledge? If knowledge is a construct, where did it come from? Uh, well, I mean, you just have to, all you have to do is watch a baby grow from the crib to, to manhood. Um, you start out with nothing. It used to be um, John Locke, I guess, we took to, to, uh, to when we, we took the concept of tabula rasa. You start out with a blank slate. You work your way upward. I, I don't know how else to say it. It's a construction. We start with nothing. Michael? Yeah. Um, well, I have a book about this, and operators are standing by. <clears throat> <laughs> Phone 1-800 and go to our webpage. We take credit cards. <laughs> Right. Um, probably the less I say about Adam and Eve, the better. I, I think the, 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 the knowledge learning question is an interesting one. We, it, it's not, we're not a blank slate. We're not born. We do have a human nature. Um, I'm sorry, we're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not born with knowledge. We don't completely learn all our knowledge. It's both. Uh, we're not a blank slate. We have like a moral sense, for example. I argue in my next book that we have moral sentiments, feelings, feelings of pride and shame and guilt and so forth that evolve. They're in our nature. It doesn't matter to me whether you think God put it there or evolution put it there. It doesn't matter. We have these, we have these moral sentiments. No different than, say, the feeling of hunger. You don't have to learn how to digest an apple. Your body has already learned it. Evolution taught it, or God, whatever. But it's in the, it's in the body. It's in the genes. You don't have to learn that. So we're born with all kinds of things. Jealousy is an incredibly powerful emotion. You don't learn that emotion. You're born with that emotion, and it has very significant reasons for, for its existence there. So those are forms of knowledge that we're born with, and lots of others we learn. Three more here and three more there, and then we will wrap up. My Bible says that, that God created the world in seven days. Everybody on earth goes by this weekly cycle. Other than creation, where do we find our seven-day, where did the seven-day weekly cycle come from? Okay. Uh, doctor, you said that there is no absolute t capital T truth. Now, uh, since you said this, I believe this is, that you believe this. My question to you, are you absolutely sure? Uh, this is a pretty simple question, but what time frame did dinosaurs exist, and is there any evidence for that in the Bible? Dr. Hoven to the right. Okay, um, 
Mr. Shimmer's statement about operator standing by is obviously me referring to my tapes out there. I'd like to point out. <laughs> uh, I would like to. Uh, I would like to point out, I've been doing this for 14 years. I've never copyrighted my material, ever. Anybody's William, uh, very free to copy my tapes, send back the originals and get their money back. I don't charge for my seminars. You find me any other evolutionist that does that. I want to see them, okay? Now, where'd the seven-day week come from? I think the only answer is God created it in six days and he rested one. I don't see any other answer to that. As far as dinosaurs, before the flood came, the Bible teaches the people used to live to be 900 years old. It's a simple biological fact that reptiles never stop growing. I think dinosaurs were giant reptiles that lived with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Noah took them on the ark, probably babies. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. And <laughs> then after the flood, people killed them, mo most of them. They were called dragons through most of history. Uh, the word dinosaur wasn't even made up till 1841. So for most of history, they're called dragons, and people killed them. And I think there could be a few stragglers still alive today, like Loch Ness Monster and the one that washed up in California. And you can see my video number three and get all that. Thank you. Kyle. With, the, uh, with regard to the seven-day week, I, I hope I'm clearly saying that I believe in seven epics. I just believe that they're longer than a 24-hour period of time. As far as the dinosaurs, uh, our ministry teaches that there was a long period of time prior to the advent of man on the earth, which was, by the way, a miracle of God. It's not something that he, man did not evolve. He's not a, a, a separate uh, creature. And um, the time period prior to man's advent here included uh, many multiple species walking across the earth, including dinosaurs. And I have no uh, concerns whatsoever that, that God could bring them to the earth and and um, choose whatever means he chose to to remove them from the earth. Michael. Yeah, um, there's nothing particularly special about seven-day weeks or seven-day cycles or whatever. There's lots and lots of versions of weeks throughout the last 6,000 years of recorded history. Uh, there's nothing sacred or special about seven days. There's no seven-day biological cycle, for example. There's a 30-day, but I don't think that's biblical. Maybe it is. <laughs> um, Am I certain that there are no certainties? <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> As for the dinosaurs, yeah, I'd love to know what deck they were on on the ark. Look, you, you guys are really missing the point of, the, of this flood story. You're missing a really good story if you're trying to figure out which deck the dinosaurs were on how God got the marsupials all the way down to Australia when the boat landed in Mount Ararat over in Turkey. How did they get there? You know, this, this is, you're missing the point of that story. Go back and read it again. It's not about factual biology. It's about something else. All right, the last three. Um, as a biologist, I'm very concerned about Dr. Holden's misunderstanding of the principles of biological evolution. And since I can't make a statement, um, Dr. Shermer, can you explain to Dr. Hovland, there's two basic concepts that he isn't understanding. Uh, first of all, he... Getting close to the statement category. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, can you explain that mutation is not about getting better, it's about being advantageous to a changing environment, and from that, survival of the fittest is not what we're talking about, it's survival to reproduce. That would work for Jeopardy, that did... Okay. I wanted to thank the doctors for a great discussion. My question is for Dr. Hoban about the flood. Um, you adhere to a literal time scale of uh, 2400 BC for the flood, and yet we have secular history that shows major civilizations and languages before that, um, when the Tower of Babel had to happen after the flood in about 2100 BC, I think you adhere to. But we have uh, cuneiform and hieroglyphics before that. How do you explain the discrepancy between the flood story and the secular history? And you get the last um, Hi. I was hoping for a little bit more of an argument from, or hoping to hear more from um, old, real, old um, world creation. And I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the scripture that says one, um, one day to God is like a thousand years to man. Let's start with Kyle, go to Michael, and finish with Dr. Hoven. Um. I think that does show us that to God, the, the time really isn't as significant of an issue. I think it also shows, uh, you could even work that argument even further and say, well, 
which 24-hour day did God use? Because our time 24 hours today isn't the same as it was uh, 7,000 years ago even. The, the rotation, the spin of the earth is going shorter. And so I, I also used to wonder, when I first started into this um, process of moving into the old earth paradigm, I used to think, well, what was it about light and day that caused God to need to be on some sort of a clock? I mean, and what if he, he I mean, God forbid, if you'll excuse the expression, but what if he was off schedule? Would he have to, you know, because it, after all, does imply that, that creation was a work, and, and after all, why did he rest at the end of it? Um, and I know that this sounds a little bit crazy, and I don't want to, to, to throw it out to you as heresy, because it would be heresy if I said God was diminished in some way by what he did. What I want to say, in fact, is why is it that we have to be so bound up in a, the, the clock, day and night, hours, as if God should have been subscribing to that particular time period, as if it makes it more instantaneous, more magical, and more mystical. When I think we can say whether it gave, he, he took it in 10 billion years or whether he did it in five minutes, all of what we see around us is an incredibly wonderful creation and couldn't have come about one iota of it by chance. Michael. Michael oh, Shermer. Me. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, on the, uh, the, the question of evolution, how does it work? Well, the, there's this m misconception of the survival of the fittest. It's not fit as in physically fit or big or strong or fat. It's whatever it takes to get the genes and in the next generation. Whoever leaves behind the most offspring that make it to the next generation and so on wins. There are examples of this. A species, uh, Dr. Hovind said, we don't know what a species is, and we can define a species. A species is a group of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations reproductively isolated from other such populations. Whatever it takes to reproductively isolate two populations, a mountain range, a hotel chain, an aqueduct, an ocean, a river, whatever, they get separated, they, the, through mutation, they change a little bit, through natural selection they change, variation, sex, uh, and so on. Then if they get back, the river dries up and the populations overlap again. If they've changed too much, they can't interbreed anymore. They are now, by definition, separate species. That is the origin of species right there. We have observed it lots of times in our own lifetime. In the uh, late 1800s, wallabies were Australian wallabies were introduced into Hawaii. Now the uh, Hawaiian wallabies can no longer interbreed because they've tried with Australian wallabies because they've changed too much. New species. That's an example of evolution at work right there. Dr. Hoven. Um, they're still wallabies. That doesn't prove they came from a rock. All right. Uh, I don't know. We're going to leave a lot of questions hanging here, which these things always do, okay? Uh, as far as marsupials to Australia, that's not a problem. Uh, the marsupials are less aggressive than most other mammals, and they would always be at the leading edge of the migration fringe. They're always pushed out of their territory by the more aggressive animals. And as the water's rising after the flood was over, the ice caps are melting. We cover all that in video number six, by the way. Uh, <laughs> They ended up trapped in Australia. That's not a problem at all. It beats, beats the idea that marsupials came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. As far as the biology, I think I do understand biology, and I resent you saying that I don't understand that. I think, I, I think most people here do clearly understand the, the mechanisms proposed for evolution, and they simply have rejected it because it's devoid of scientific evidence. That statement smacked of a little bit of, hey, I'm smart because I believe it, and you folks are all dumb because you don't believe in it, and I would resent that very much, okay? Secondly, as far as uh, a day as being a 1,000 years, um, I think there are two references, Psalms 90, verse 4, and 2 Peter 3, where it talks about a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Neither of those verses are talking about the creation, number one, and both of them say thousand, not million or billion. So how on earth do you get 17 billion out of those verses? I don't know, okay? And as far as limiting God, I'm not the one who limits God. The idea, I think you're stuck on this idea that it, it, it's, the, earth is 17, the universe is 17 billion years old, and we have to make the Bible say that somehow. You're the one limiting God to the, the silly evolution theory. That's the current vogue. And if everybody would just come to my seminar, we would get them all straightened out on that. Uh, now, uh, as right, we... Is my time up? Is my time up? Yes. I... <laughs> no, one more. Uh, yeah. DrDino.com. The Bible says, uh, God gave them up, Psalms 81, he gave them up to their own lust. He gave them up, he gave them up, Romans 1. I think God gives up on people when they choose not to believe in God. Some people just simply don't like God. The Bible says God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And if you believe you came from a rock, you're believing a lie, okay? 
Evolution's been discredited years ago. That there's no evidence for it except things that have been proven wrong. I don't say you are a particular a liar. I hope I didn't say that tonight. But if you're teaching those particular things that have been proven wrong, then you would be. I don't know what you teach and what you don't. Evolution's a dying theory. It's on artificial life support, kept only alive from the religious zealots. Um, he looks fine. Yep, he looks fine. Evolution is a dying religion, just like many, many false teachings have died hard, horrible deaths over the years. Evolution is no different. The only reason people haven't given up on this silly idea is because the only alternative is creation. All right, that Dr. Hyde. I, um, I'd like you to join me in thanking our panel this evening.